Um, and now I'd like to introduce um, Matthew Forstatter from UMKC and Research Director at the Gonzaga Institute, who will chair the first session. Matt. Okay, actually, I think um, I would ask all the panel members to come down, but uh, if any are using PowerPoint, then maybe actually your fellow uh, panel members, so maybe one at a time, and then after everyone's done for discussion, we'll have everyone go on. Does that sound? And are, are we... Uh, the PowerPoints are set up. Okay, so, yeah, great. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I also am very happy to be here. Um, I don't need to thank every Buddy again because many thanks have been given. So I think it's time that we proceed with uh, more of the substantive discussion. This panel, session one, is called Towards Sustainable Communities. And um, uh, we have three papers uh, on the panel. Uh, Ahmed Saliman, uh, who is uh, from here at Denison. Uh, on sustainable energy for developing countries. Uh, El Sadiq El Sheikh uh, from the HIFAS Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society on corporate power and structural racialization in the U.S. food system, the Farm Bill as a case, and Akdas Afsal from UMKC um, and uh, he's going to be speaking on energy, economy, and ecology, reimagining the Troika. Uh, so the first paper will be Ahmed Soliman, and um, each presenter will have approximately 20 uh, minutes. Uh, if you go 30. a little bit over, that's fine. Actually, 30. Oh, 30 per? Okay. Yeah. Five minutes. Sure. So. <laughs> Twenty-seven. Okay. <laughs> right. So is this thing on? All right. Yeah. If you can see, it, I mean, the uh, problem was the only thing I was saying about the, you know, if, if you want to see his slide, but uh, otherwise you're welcome to sit there. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ahmed Solomon. I'm a visiting faculty here at Denison. Um, today I'll be talking to you about sustainable energy for, um, for uh, developing communities. It's more of a general talk to show you what's out there in terms of affordable, sustainable systems that can be actually used in rural areas and uh, rural communities and developed communities. And I really, um, just first of all, I need to say that I'm really happy to see uh, uh, a title like this, Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. I, I rarely see anything that relates sustainable and prosperity in one sentence. Uh, don't really find this a lot. And also the other thing is, uh, this picture here basically summarizes what I'll be talking about. So I might as well just finish it in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, so here basically it, it shows solar ovens. Instead of using uh, biomass, and I'll be talking about this, we can use actually the sun uh, to cook our food and so on. And I'll be talking about this in more details in a second. So, um, the topics that I'll be uh, discussing, it's a little bit high for me. So, energy and the path to prosperity and the relation between them. Uh, the global primary consumption and production of energy. Uh, basic energy needs in developing and rural, uh, rural communities. And I'll be using, uh, switching between developing and rural uh, a lot. So, uh, from the economics point of view, it might not be the right thing to do, but it's easier for me anyway uh, to understand it like this. Um, and then meeting the needs for these communities. Uh, do we go the traditional route or do we go with a sustainable route? And hopefully we can follow the sustainable route. Uh, local sustainability, uh, sustainable energy for rural communities. And then uh, the eco-village concept that can be applied to rural communities. If we're trying to develop rural communities, so we might as well just start correct in the first time, right? Instead of going the traditional way. And then uh, bioenergy, uh, I'm going to be showing you some of the research I've done in Cornell and then SUNY Cobalskill. And um, I'm going to finish up with some successful examples 
that we can see of how people actually, uh, the people who actually chose to go the sustainable route, uh, how they did it. So to start with um, energy, to make it easier, uh, at least this is how I found it with my students, to make it e easier for the students to understand the concept of energy, instead of talking about that we, you're using this certain amount of kilowatts hour or millions of BTUs and, uh, and uh, barrels of oil, it's really hard to get a good grasp like what's a million BTU, is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you're using a million BTUs, is that good or are you actually harming the environment? So I find uh, the concept of uh, energy servants to be actually better in terms of uh, understanding the consumption of energy. So what is an energy, energy servant? So each one of us on average can produce about 100 watts of power. So if you're sitting on a bike and this bike is connected to a generator, you can produce about 100 watt um, uh, power that runs 24 seven. So the question here is, how is our energy consumption related to this 100 watts, right? And this is how we define the energy servant. So if we are using 200 watts, this means you have two energy servants working for you to produce the energy that you need to survive, right? If you're using one, then you're good, right? But this is really happening right now. So if we were to look at uh, the consumption of different regions in the, in the world in terms of energy servants, so on the x-axis here, you see the region, and the y-axis, you see the number of energy servants per person or per capita. And as you can see here, the average in the world is about 27 energy servants. So this means the average, on average, 27 people are working 27, sorry, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to provide us with energy that we need every day. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about just energy that you have in your home, but here we're talking about the total amount of energy. So energy to plant the trees, uh, plant the uh, crops and uh, harvest them, freeze them, um, heat them and uh, driving your car, taking the plane, coming here, turning on these lights, so any kind of energy that you're using throughout the day. So in the US, or should I, should I say like in North America in general, US, Canada, and, and Mexico, we're using about 86 energy servants. So that makes it a little bit easier to comprehend how much energy we're actually using. In Africa, on the other hand, if we're to look at Africa, on average it's about five energy servants. So you can see the big difference between the consumption between uh, Africa as a developing continent in this case and, uh, and North America. Now, if we were to look at um, the human development index, and I use this as, as a sign for uh, uh, respect, and I think this is, this is acceptable in, in the economics world, right? The human development index. So the higher the index, the better. The lower the index, that's not so good because it includes the life expectancy, it includes the um, um, the education level, that basically the prosperity in, in life in general. And as you can see here, this is plotted as a function of the energy servants that you're using. So, the more energy servants, as you can see here, the better the life uh, that you'll get, the higher the human development index. However, you notice that around 50 energy servants, it kind of like starts plateau or it'll go a little bit lower. To me, this is actually good news. And the reason for that is you can actually create a cutoff for where is the proper line for, or on average, where's the proper line for energy consumption that you can have and still be able to have good life. And I guess Switzerland would be a good example for a prosperous country, right? So what we're trying to do here is try to bring these guys from using too much energy and still maintaining the same kind of uh, life expectancy and the same kind of prosperity, bring them all the way to here in terms of energy conservation. And at the same time, we're trying, trying to be, bring these guys up from being low in the energy consumption and, and low in the uh, human development index all the way up to where it's an appropriate level as compared to Switzerland, for example. So this is what we're trying to do, conserve and also bring up um, uh, the other countries. Question. So, Question. yes. If you don't mind, you just go back to that other one? Are you gonna get to, uh, in your conversation, what is the carrying capacity of the Earth so that energy per capita? Uh, what do you mean by carrying capacity? What is the maximum energy used that isn't extractive of the Earth? So there's a different version of this chart that takes the Human Development Index versus right. how many Earths of uh, environmental energy, environmental capacity. And so there's a similar chart, just the dotted line is more to the left because you, it's hard to get human development uh, with any energy.
energy that won't be extracted out of the earth's resources. Oh, I see. So you're not using fossil fuel and so on. That's no, whatever. The more it's renewable, the more it's okay. Right. So you're all right. So I guess if I understand the question, like using energy flows rather than fuel. So instead of using something that will disappear after a while, use something that's renewable. Right. More or less. One version of the question. Yeah. No. Unfortunately, I don't have a graph like that, but um, um, I'm sure we can do this estimate. But I haven't. Yeah. That will be interesting to see. So where do you use this energy? Basically, it's can. This energy can be basically this. Uh, uh, used in four sectors. And these four sectors or four main sectors are basically residential, commercial, industrial sector, and transportation. Now, this is the average of the world. Uh, of course, for every individual country, the, the sectors would, be, would look different. So for instance, for instance, if you were to look at China, the industrial sector actually goes almost like 75%. And if we were to look at uh, developing countries, if we take Ghana, for example, then the residential, instead of having a 13%, it goes almost to 60%. There's not too much industry over there. So this keeps on fluctuating based on uh, the sector we're talking about. So the energy systems that I'll be covering today will roughly cover these four sectors. And I'll show you examples for that. So uh, whenever we talk about energy, if you don't mind, I'm going to stand over here to see it. So whenever we talk about energy, um, we need to couple this with, with a couple of things. First, the population. Second. Uh, the uh, population growth rate, right? Uh, things are not static on Earth. So for instance here, if you look at the energy per capita, the energy consumption per capita, Africa over here is the lowest, <coughs> followed by uh, Asia, and then of course North America here is using too much energy per capita. However, if you were to couple this with the population, the total consumption of energy will look different. And your total impact on the environment would look a little bit different as well. So it's not going to be as low as here. So, <clears throat> combining this with the population growth rates, China is going very high, 44 million or 44 and a half million per year. Uh, if you were to compare that with uh, Europe, for example, it's two and a half million per year. So there's a big difference in the population growth. So, <clears throat> if we're trying to uh, develop or uh, make lives better in developing and rural areas, we need to take into, into consideration the impact on the environment, the total impact on the, on the environment. Just because Asia right now is not using a lot of energy per capita, however, just adding to it the population growth and also the population, then the total consumption will look a little bit different, as you can see here. So the total consumption of energy, <coughs> this graph, graph basically shows the consumption of energy and uh, the production of energy in every region here. Total consumption of energy, even though uh, Asia is using per capita less energy than North America, however, the total consumption of energy because of the population is uh, adding to uh, the mix. So you can see the total consumption here is higher. And also from this graph, you can see who's actually producing and who's using more energy than what they need. North America <coughs> producing less than what they consume, Asia producing less than what cons they consume. The Middle East is definitely producing more. And this is where you see the trade between uh, the different countries in terms of energy. So what are the basic needs for any developing uh, nation or for any rural community? It's basically two things, heat and electricity. Uh, I'm going to be taking Africa as an example here. <coughs> so if we were to look at uh, the traditional biomass use for heating in Africa, as you can see here, uh, on, average, on average, you have about 70% uh, of the population in Africa rely on traditional biomass for heating, but for cooking mainly. North Africa, not so much, so it's not really a big problem for them, for now at least. And I'm gonna show you an example where actually biomass is a big problem for North Africa, Egypt, for example. But anyway, for now, we're gonna say that the population does not rely that much on uh, biomass. The issue with biomass is it's used for cooking or for heating, and it's used unprocessed. So this is a very inefficient way of actually uh, producing heat, and that has a very negative impact on the environment and on health. So if you want to look at the total population in millions, so here, uh, total population that relies on uh, traditional biomass for use. Sub-Saharan Africa, you're talking about 700 million people rely on biomass. If you look at the percentage of electrification in Africa, North Africa is doing very well. So they already have central grids that extend almost everywhere. Uh, rural areas don't have major issues with electricity. 
However, the grid is not totally reliable though. So even though it's extended, that doesn't mean it's reliable. However, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, only 20 or only about 16% or 17% of the population actually receives, uh, receives electricity from the grid. To me, this is good news. This means we can actually go with different types of sustainable energy that we can use in rural areas away from using central grids and be able to electrify um, or provide electricity to rural areas. So if you look at the total population without electricity, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 6 million, 600 million uh, people. As compared to North Africa, only, it's only one, uh, 1 million. So how do we meet the needs? How do we meet the needs for heating and how do we meet the needs for electricity? There are two ways. Either we go the traditional route or we go the sustainable route. So I'm going to go over uh, what will happen if we go the traditional route. I'm going to go over what will, we, can, we can have if we have the sustainable route. And I'll try to do this in 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Your previous slide, one million North Africa, what does that, who is, who is, who is the one million, is that just the... People who do not have electricity what, from the what grid. what's the number to do? Uh, so that will be, like for instance in Egypt, for example, it will be like almost 80 million or 80 something million. Yeah, uh, I don't have the total population, but it's one minus the other. Well, yeah. you've got the... It's, 60 percentage, so it's 99 percent, so, right, the 1 million is without. Well, yeah, I guess if you, yeah, so I guess if you go this route, so you, can, you have the 600, 622 million and you multiply that by the 26 percent, you can figure out the total population of Africa. And then from that you subtract the one for Sub-Sahara and then you have what's left for uh, North America, North Africa. So if you go the traditional route, this means you have centralized grids. And this means you're going to be using fossil fuels. So if you have a centralized grid with major power plants, then you simply just extend the, the grid. And then, of course, you're going to be using fossil fuel in this case. The sustainable route, on the other hand, is, on the other hand is instead of using centralized grids, you can use what's called micro or mini grids. Or better yet, you can use what's called the standalone systems. And I'm going to, I'm going to be covering this uh, in a second here. And of course, you can use bioenergy. So if you're going to be relying on biomass, or if the population relies on biomass, you might as well just make them rely on biomass, but in a more efficient way. So this way they're not producing too much pollution and they're not harming themselves a lot. So if we were to look at the centralized grids, uh, the cost of extending the grid uh, based on uh, the World Bank estimates in 2000 is about $10,000 uh, $10, per kilometer. However, in my opinion, this is a very conservative estimate. Uh, the DOE here in, in the U.S. estimates it three times that. It's about uh, 31,000 uh, per kilometer if you want to be extending the grid. And of course, it's going to depend on the terrain. It's going to depend on the power you're trying to deliver, the number of substations you're going to have on the way. And also, it's going to depend on the labor cost. If it's in the U.S., it's going to be more. If it's in Africa, it's going to probably be less. So all of this are different factors that will go into um, estimating how much uh, money you're going to be spending to extend the grids to rural areas. Nevertheless, the point I want to get across here is it's expensive. Uh, you cannot just simply extend the wire and that's it. The other issue is, even if you extend the grid, the quality of the centralized grid itself might not be that good. So you might have vulnerability in, vulnerability in the grid, the power can go down, <clears throat> and you might have issues. And this, we see this a lot in uh, developing countries. <clears throat> And even if you have a centralized grid connected to your home, you might, you might as well just have, uh, because it's vulnerable and it's not, um, it's not uh, um, available all the time, you need to have some sort of um, um, a secondary power supply, for instance, like a generator or a solar cell or a wind turbine and so on. And worst of all, if you're going to be using the sort of centralized uh, systems, most likely you're going to be relying on fossil fuel, either, either uh, natural gas or, or oil or uh, coal to be able to supply this. So what are the effects of fossil fuel? Uh, you can divide them into different two categories. One is local and uh, short term, and the other one is long term and uh, global. So if you were to look, to look at the short term, for example, uh, this is a, a picture from uh, China in 2014. The air quality was so bad. This is taken in the morning, by the way. So the air quality was so bad that they had to actually uh, broadcast uh, sunrise and sunset on screens and major squares. If you um, care about artwork, 
This is the impact of acid rain on artwork. So this picture was taken in uh, 1908. The same picture is taken again in 1968, 60, uh, six years difference, and you can see the impact of acid rain. If you don't care that much about art, you need to take care about the integrity of the building. So you can see here the corrosion or the uh, disappearance of the mortar that's holding the bricks together. So you have issues there. If you don't care about the bricks and you don't care about the artwork, you should care about the, the uh, ecology. Acid rain, when it falls on the ground, it increases the acidity on the ground, it increases the acidity in the lakes, uh, in fresh water. So that causes big problems to fish, causes big problems to birds, and so on. So the ecosystem will start changing. Air pollution in urban areas, uh, especially if it has a lot of particulates, is bad. This picture uh, is from Sydney. So this is an area, uh, so this is a lung of a person who used to live in an area, and I believe it was Sydney. Uh, as compared to the lung of a person, and these are two are non-smokers, as compared to a lung of a person who lived in rural communities. So you can see the big difference based on the air quality. So uh, I'm going to be focusing on particulate matter or the PMs. And uh, I'll give you an example right, right now for why. Uh, just to clear, uh, to make sure we understand what PM is. So PM is particulate matter. They can be formed directly at the source or they can form chemically in the atmosphere. They have different sizes. Uh, if you want to compare this to your uh, human hair, human hair is about 70 microns in size. PM10 is about seven times smaller than the human hair. PM2.5, which is smaller, 2.5 microns and smaller, um, is actually much smaller than, like four of them will fit in the PM10 and so on. And as compared to a, a, a sand particle, fine sand particle, you can see the difference between PM2.5 and, and a regular sand particle. Why do we talk about this? Well, lungs, like what you saw in the other picture that you had before. Anything higher than PM10 can be stopped by your nose, basically, and your throat. So it's going to be captured by, you, by your nose and throat. However, anything less than PM10, PM10 like PM2.5, PM1, PM1.1, and so on, it will start traveling <coughs> through your throat into your lungs. And the problem is, the smaller they get, the harder for your lungs to cough them out. So they stay there. And right now, some new research actually found that uh, fi ultra-fine particles, like uh, in the nano-sized particles, actually go into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So they can get launched into the brain, they can get launched into the kidneys, into the liver, and so on, and some might cause cancer. Mm -hmm. The issue is not with the particles themselves or the particulates themselves, but actually, because they have a large surface area with respect to their volume, they can absorb a lot of chemicals on their, air, on their surface. So now you're not only transporting the particles, but you're transporting the, the particles plus the chemicals that are absorbed on the surface of the outside. So that becomes a big problem. If you want to look at the um, impact, health impacts, uh, premature death, non-fatal heart attacks, uh, aggravated asthma, decreased in lung function, and so on. So it's really bad. Particulate matter is really bad. Now let's look at the picture of particulate matter, PM2.5, globally. <coughs> You can see here, uh, most of North Africa, the Middle East, all the way basically uh, the uh, Central and Southeast Asia, they are the highest pollutants here. Uh, you have some in Central America, a little bit in Southern America, South America. So population-wise, you have a lot of population that's being exposed to high values of PM2.5. And actually, um, here we're talking about like say if you want to look at Egypt, for example, so you know, we're talking about something in, in the range of the 50 micrograms per cubic meter. In the US, the cutoff value for, specified by the EPA, of course, that for healthy living uh, in the presence of PM2.5 is 35. So uh, we're going way above that over there in Egypt. So we need to do something about this. The nice thing about short-term localized effects is once you fix them, it can, it's not going to take that long of a time to actually see the difference. And it can affect the environment locally uh, much quicker than if we were to talk about global warming and so on. Uh, this is what we're familiar with, more familiar with. So when you talk about long-term impact of uh, fossil fuel, you basically think, the first thing you think of is the polar bears and the melting of the ice, um, uh, of the glaciers and uh, the ice cap and so on. You think of the dry uh, or the drought and flooding cycle, the change in the drought and flooding cycle and so on. Global effects. <coughs> take a long time to fix, and they take a long time to observe. 
So if you were to look at the total emissions of CO2 and one of the, uh, of course, one of the greenhouse gases that we all, all know is CO2. So if you look, were to look at the emissions of CO2, uh, Asia has taken the biggest part in the emissions, uh, followed by North America. And Africa is not really that far behind uh, uh, Eurasia and uh, South America. And actually, if you were to take into the consideration the, uh, the growth, the population growth and so on, there might be a chance where you actually see uh, these if we maintain things as inefficient as they are right now, we might see these things uh, or the emissions actually growing higher. Now, this is a very impressive map. Here we're looking at black carbon. Black carbon are particulates that are black. They are actually more of a greenhouse. Um, it's not a gas, it's a particulate. More of a greenhouse element than uh, CO2. One kilogram of uh, black carbon lasting for two weeks in the atmosphere is equivalent to 700 kilograms of CO2 lasting for 100 years mm -hmm. in terms of the impact on the environment, in terms of the global warming. So look at this. This is the black carbon uh, coming out and the impact of black carbon on warming the earth coming out from something as simple as residential kerosene lamps. So as you can see here, the developing countries basically take the most of uh, the highest emitters, basically, in terms of uh, black carbon coming from something as simple as a small kerosene lamp. So the common sources of air pollution are basically like what you see here, a small kerosene lamp that's being widely used in Africa and in the developing countries in general. They're being used uh, for night use, of course, and sometimes even for day use. And uh, even when the sun is out and it gets too dark inside, there are no windows and so on, so you might uh, actually use that. <coughs> The other source for uh, air pollution is uh, cooking using biomass in enclosed environment like indoors like this. And uh, another example like in North Africa, like in Egypt, burning the agricultural waste. And this is a major problem that happens in Egypt every fall. Farmers basically dry up all the waste that they have from the uh, harvesting season and they let it dry and then after that they burn it. And when they burn it, all of this cloud will cover the delta and cover Cairo and becomes a major problem. This happens every fall. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do here is trying to harvest this and make it in a more sustainable way rather than and make a good use of it rather than just waste it like that. Uh, the World Health Organization and UNDP released a statement back in 2004 considered working in the kitchen as uh, a dangerous thing to do. Like, it's completely different than what we have here in the U.S., for example. If you want to have fun with your family, you just go to the kitchen, make a nice meal. However, it's completely different if you were to talk about rural areas. Making a meal is basically uh, a lethal thing to do. If you were to look at uh, what's called the energy ladder, <clears throat> the more you go in terms of uh, economic prosperity and development, the better the type of fuel that you can use for uh, cooking, for example. This example over here shows an open wood, uh, an open uh, flame uh, wood stove, and as you can see, it's indoors. Uh, one of the major issues, of course, is wood is being burnt inefficiently. You're going to have a buildup of CO2 uh, and particulates inside the room, and also since it, it's a combustion process, it's actually using oxygen in the room. So after a while, you have a decrease in the concentration of oxygen, you have an increase in CO2, and then you have an increase in particulate matter, and all of this while you have women and children are in home. Some of the articles uh, that I've seen actually talk about indoor pollution as uh, gender specific and age specific. And the reason for that is most of the people are exposed to it are basically women and children. And that basically goes into the health impacts and how uh, premature deaths for children can actually be impacted by something as simple as cooking at home. So <clears throat> this is if we were to go the traditional route. Now let's look at the happy side here. If you were to go with a sustainable route, look at solar energy. You can use solar thermal for heating, and this can be done for residential and commercial systems. Uh, and here I'm talking small scale. I'm not talking large scales like what we have here in the U.S. in terms of <laughs> solar thermal power plants and so on. So everything that I'll be talking about is small scale residential, village scale type, and so on. So solar thermal uh, for heat, solar PV for electricity, and can be used uh, residential and commercial as well. The bio-waste, instead of just burning it inefficiently, we can actually process this bio-waste and make good use of it in a more efficient way. So you can have other combustion <coughs> to produce heat in a larger scale than the residential. So you can use it in commercial and industrial. You can use gasification to produce 
gases that you can use to run your engine, for example. So it can be used for transportation, commercial, and industrial. And then biogas um, that can be used for heat for residential and commercial systems. Uh, biogas is basically uh, collecting all the human waste and animal waste and so on and trap it in a big container underground so it does not uh, get exposed to air. So you can have uh, anaerobic digestion that's happening inside the biomass, and then it's going to release methane. And then you crack, capture this methane, and you can use it for cooking, to burn it to, for cooking, and so on, or for heating, and so on. I'll be talking more in details about gasification and powder combustion, because this is where uh, what I did in my research. Solar, uh, as you can see here, in terms of radiation, the developing countries are actually blessed by having too much solar incident on uh, their land. So if you can see here, the highest radiation incident per meter squared per day globally is actually located in the zone where we have developing countries, right? Where we have rural areas and so on. So we can use solar for, um, uh, solar applications for rural areas. So um, how do you use solar PV? You can use it for, um, uh, in a mini grid system, basically, you and your neighbors decide to uh, install solar panels and you connect all yourselves together away from the centralized grid. And then basically you form your own tiny little microgrid or tiny little mini grid. And this is what you use for uh, power supply. Uh, you don't have major infrastructure. Uh, it's a localized system, so it's near consumption points. So you don't have a lot of transmission cables uh, to transfer all um, the power. This means you're not going to have higher voltages, which actually would re reduce the cost and can be <coughs> set up by individuals or co-ops. So it's either I can set it up in my home or I can, or I can just uh, form a co-op between myself and my neighbors and then form this um, energy system. And of course, in a standalone system, you have your solar system and then it's connected to batteries for charging and then you can use that for uh, powering your home and powering the other appliances that you have. Now, <coughs> if we were to look at the solar electric generation and around the world, it's unfortunate that even though Africa and the Middle East and uh, Central, Central and South America are actually exposed to, to too much radiation of the sun, actually good radiation of the sun, there's nothing called too, too much radiation. It's always good to have sun. Uh, even though they are exposed to a lot of sun, however, in terms of the solar uh, electricity generation, they are really not even close to uh, where they should be. Europe, on the other hand, that actually gets less radiation, are actually doing way better than North America and doing definitely way better than Africa and the Middle East and so on. So that needs to change. So, so there's a bright side to that. Even though Africa is low, however, there are major leaps here that you can see from 2000 to 2012 in terms of generation. Even though it's still a small scale and a small amount, however, at least consciously they are starting to understand this and they're starting to adopt solar systems and um, and their uh, electric generation. And one thing that will add to that is basically the price of uh, power that you get from solar arrays is actually dropping right now. So we started in the 70s by almost $80 per watt. Right now we're going to close to 80 cents per watt. So uh, that's a major uh, drop down in terms of uh, cost. What can you use solar power for? You can use it to power uh, small uh, water pumps to get clean water. You can uh, generate electricity for it, for uh, small consumption, like in small huts like this. <clears throat> you can use it instead of kerosene lamps. You can have uh, solar LED lamps to light up the house and so on in a nicer and a cleaner manner. And also, this is not a solar-powered camel. This is actually a <laughs> solar-powered clinic. It's a mobile clinic that goes from town to town. And the way to keep the medicine cold is by having refrigerators. How would they power this? using solar panels here. And the nice thing is they use the camels to transport the medicine rather than using SUVs because they are uh, cheaper. That's one thing. And they actually they can handle the desert much better than an SUV. So uh, this picture is taken from Kenya, I believe. So uh, that's always uh, a good thing to see. What about the solar thermal applications? Uh, they're straightforward, like what you see here. So you can have solar uh, stoves. You can have uh, solar ovens. And you can have solar thermal systems for heating water that you can use for cooking or for bathing and so on for whatever application you're going to be using. <clears throat> now, the eco-village concept, and this is something that I'm actually working on right now. 
how do you introduce the eco-village concept to rural areas? So since we're trying to develop the country, or the community rather, let's develop it in a more eco-friendly way. So what do we mean by eco-friendly? We talk about low-cost construction using local materials instead of relying on cement and relying on, on uh, concrete and, and, um, and steel and so on. We can actually rely on local material that you have um, in the community. Use simple designs uh, so it can be built by people, uh, by the locals, by the owners, instead of having professionals coming in. And this way you are cutting the cost. And then you can incorporate um, passive systems for cooling. You can incorporate uh, passive systems for heating and for, and you can uh, include uh, active systems for heating and also for providing the power and so on. Uh, so I'm, what I'm doing is actually basically running calculations for um, a family of four living in a rural area, how would they actually uh, be able to afford uh, building a system that's very close to a net zero energy system, basically, using off-the-shelf technologies. So we're not talking about something that will be developed 100 years from now or 20 years from now and so on. No, I'm talking about things that you can simply create a shopping list for people in Africa and they simply can go and go ahead and buy it. Now, I'm guided by the designs of one of um, my favorite architects, basically. Hassan Fathi, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, he's an architect uh, from Egypt, and he's considered by many the father of sustainable architecture. He's been calling for sustainable ar architecture since the 30s and 40s, so a long time ago before we had anything related to energy prices. And uh, he has different books uh, that has different designs. One of them is, uh, one of his most famous, famous books are The Architecture for the Poor, which is very interesting, for adding the word poor architecture. Just because you're poor, that, that does not mean that you cannot live in a nice design or nicely designed house. So what he did is he basically uh, designed different uh, structures and he actually built different structures uh, in Egypt and even here in the U.S. and in New Mexico using mud brick, mud brick build, uh, uh, construction techniques. Like what we see here in this village in Egypt. It's called the New Gorna. And actually the New Gorna is considered by the UNESCO a heritage site that needs to be preserved. Uh, because of the architecture uh, and sustainable architecture that it has. So I'm guided by these designs here to look at the passive systems that he used for cooling and the passive systems that he used for heating and so on. And this will definitely cut down on the active systems that you can install. Like instead of having to install, to install like three uh, solar panels, you can install just one. So that will definitely cut the cost by simply changing the design. Now, looking at bioenergy, <clears throat> and these are the research that I've done in the past. So instead of looking at burning or consuming bioenergy as is, like the way you get it from the field, instead of doing this, what we're trying to do here is simply process it. So if you have wood logs, break it down to smaller sizes or into wood chips or form it into pellets and then form it into powders and so on. Why do we bother about doing this? Well, you're increasing the surface area this way. So this means you're allowing more oxygen to go and see the biomass. And this means you can have more efficient combustion than if you were to use a wood log. For instance, if you try to burn uh, a phone book as is, it's not going to burn. It's going to burn only on the edges. It's going to be very hard to burn everything. But if you cut, tear it down and cut it down into pieces and try to burn the same amount, it's going to burn much faster. It's the same concept over here. So you have better diffusion of oxygen. <clears throat> that makes it more efficient and much faster, faster combustion. And if it's much faster combustion, this means you have more power. So if you need heating, but not on a resi the residential scale, but more of an in industrial scale, then you can use processed biomass to, pro to do this. More efficient, more um, uh, environmentally friendly uh, way. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, I'm almost done. Yeah. So if you were to look at some of the uh, uh, experiments that we've done, we looked at wood powder flames, we looked at cornstarch flames, we looked at flames uh, from coffee powder and so on. Not that we recommend that you actually do this, but uh, wood powder frame was what we actually were interested in. So we were able to produce a lot of power and a more efficient combustion. And the nice thing about powder combustion, it has the ability of going on and off as you require. If you ever try to grill with charcoal, what do you do? You set up your charcoal, you have to wait for half an hour till it reaches the proper combustion temperature, right? And then you start grilling and so on. And then when you're done, you have to wait for it to cool down by itself. This is called transient time. And this is the worst time that you can have a biomass in, because this is where you have the worst, if, uh, worst emissions, uh, worst temperatures. Actually, it's not worst temperatures, but worst emissions 
with respect to the temperature. So you can have a lot of CO coming out because it's inefficient. You can have a lot of uh, uh, long chain hydrocarbons and so on, tar formation and so on. But here in wood powder, this is almost happening instant instantaneously. So once you switch it on, it goes on, switch it off, it turns off. So that's one of the nice things about wood powder. That's why we were looking at this. Now when we compared wood powder emissions um, with pellet emissions from another burner, we were able to see that our wood powder uh, prototype was basically 40% less in beam to half emissions. And this is just the very initial prototype, not the modified ones or not the better designed ones. So that's a, that's a good improvement uh, over using biomass as a raw material. Uh, gasification, on the other hand, here, what we're trying to do with biomass or bio-waste is actually um, doing incomplete combustion on purpose. And you do this in, in sealed reactors. And the reason for that is when you have a bio-waste that's going under incomplete combustion, instead of producing carbon dioxide and water, it produces carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and some traces of CH4. All of these are combustible gases. So you can actually use these gases to run your equipment. So we call, syn we call it synthetic gas or syn gas, or sometimes it's called producer gas. <clears throat> and you can use it for heating if you just were to ignite it directly. I don't recommend that. Or you can create liquid fuels from it, or you can create H2 for, for, for fuel cell fuels, uh, fuel cell batteries. However, my favorite uh, use, of, use of syn gas is actually where to use it directly in engines, to run your car, to run your generator, and so on. So basically the setup looks like this. So you have your gasifier or your reactor. You feed it, so you have a feed system that goes into the gasifier. You're feeding it with biomass in a pellet form or a chip form. It gets gasified, and then you have the sink gas going into a gas cleanup system, goes get into a then cooling system, and goes in the gas cleanup system, and then it goes into the engine. And this is basically a project that I had back in Sony, uh, Sony Cobblescale that I initiated for students. <clears throat> so basically what we did is we bought this small ATV, <coughs> a John Deere, uh, six-wheel drive, and then we bought um, a commercial downdraft gasifier from Berkeley from California. And we tried to hook these two <coughs> up and see how they work. And the idea here is to be able to use waste, uh, farm waste that you find in your farm right, to run your own farm equipment. So your lawnmowers, your tractors, your uh, ATVs, and so on, without relying on in any fossil fuel. So we did this in upstate New York, uh, where they have lots of farming land, that's for sure. Now, if you don't want to use it for your car, you can use it for uh, generating electricity, right? So you can hook it up to a generator, and it does the same thing exactly like your car. This is an example of a 10 kilo, uh, kilowatt power uh, gasifier uh, that you can buy directly off the shelf from uh, Berkeley, California. So some of the successful examples, and this is the last slide, by the way. Some of the successful examples are <clears throat> waste to energy. So you can have gasification power plants, and this is what we have in India, for example. So this is good news for people in Egypt, for example, if they want to be using their bio-waste, right? So instead of burning it and then uh, destroying the health of others, they can simply gasify it and get energy out of it. Now, the good news here with regards to Egypt is I found online that there are some people who actually collect the rice husk and their agricultural waste and they form it into powder and form it into pellets and they sell it online. I think it's almost $100 per ton, which is good money for that. So if you're talk about, talking about job creation, this is a good way of doing green job creation instead of burning it so you can process it and make use of it. Lighting Africa, uh, it's a... Uh, it's a program that basically replaces kerosene lamps with LED lights in Africa. The Grameen Shakti in Bangladesh <clears throat> basically providing green solutions for low-income families. And I believe they use the micro systems as well so to provide uh, uh, cost coverage for uh, the green solutions they have. And also there are some nonprofit organizations that are working around the world in terms of teaching people how to use sustainable gardening and teach, teaching people how to build their own solar systems, like for example, solar local uh, solar ovens um, in uh, Nicaragua here, done by uh, artists for Sue. Now the last slide, I'm sorry about this, but the last slide is uh, think simple, and I, this is what I always tell my students. Think simple, don't go like, if you have a problem with energy, don't just say, I'm gonna buy a solar panel or something like that. Look for a simpler solution first, and then move to the more, more complicated solution. Uh, have you ever seen this? 
thing before. You know what this is? It's a. Um, all right. So this is basically a bottle of water, right? Exactly. Thank you very much. So now you burned my surprise. You ruined my surprise. But <laughs> <laughs> this is a water bottle, light bulb. So basically, what they have done is they got a, a recycled water bottle, filled it up with water and bleach to to prevent the formation of mold, and they stuck it on the roof like this. And this is what it do. It's a 55 watt light bulb that runs for five years, and all you have to do when, after five years is just open it up, fill it up again, and then close it and seal it again. And it runs perfectly, and it costs like uh, I think about 50 cents to, to produce. And of course, if you go to a, 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 a recycle waste site or something like that, you can simply collect it for free. Water is for free, I guess, and you can have bleach for a small amount of bleach that's almost close to nothing. So this is a simple idea of how to actually have sustainable energy without having to go the hard way or having a, a costly way of doing uh, things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, questions at the end. Sure. Um, time for me. So uh, Elsa B. El Sheikh from the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, Corporate Power, and Racial Structuralization of the U.S. Food System, the Farm Bill as a case. Thank you. Where is my PowerPoint? Uh, any help? Yeah. Uh, so till I uh, prepare this, I really want to uh, extend my thanks to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I want to extend my thanks to uh, Fadl and Matt and all the folks here at the Ben Zegar Institute for uh, for the invitation and also for the. Uh, the warm welcome. I'm from the Hassan Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, one thing, uh, I've been working for a couple of years with colleagues of mine on a uh, global food system. Uh, but since we are in the US, we thought about <coughs> how about the US food system uh, rather than just the global. So we've been working back and forth between both of the idea of how the global be impacted by the local and uh, vice versa. So um, I'm very excited to share with you uh, a very comprehensive report we did in the Farm Bill coming out next week. Uh, what I'm going to just run through here is just to give you kind of uh, uh, an overview uh, of that report. I know most of us might know the food system, uh, but the food system, uh, according to the people who study it, is an extremely complicated system uh, that includes, besides environment, besides the farming uh, territories or people or input or outputs, also uh, encompasses political, economical, social, cultural, and environmental uh, systems. So I'm going to read just in sake of time. Uh, so the United States food system and the outcomes generated by the U.S. Farm Bill are characterized by widespread social, economic, political, and environmental inequity. These outcomes are characteristic of a society that produces inequity in every domain of life, social, economic, political, and environmental lives. Our report finds that inequity within the food system such as limited access to nutrition and affordable food, high quality land, or farmer support program benefits cannot be addressed without addressing inequity within society as a whole, uh, such as low income and limited employment benefits, unfair treatment by the state and federal institutions for the farm workers, and limited democratic influence and access to position of power itself. As such, a central concern for us writing this report was two major things. One is the how cooperation actually influencing and controlling our food system. And the second thing is a particular for the US is a structural racialization. And I will uh, go and just define those for you very quickly so I can keep everybody in the same terms as I use them. 
So for us, the food system is any food system is defined by all practices, processes, and infrastructure required to feed the population. This will be including agricultural production, harvesting, processing, packaging, distribution, consumption, and disposal as well. As the inputs required and the outputs produced at each of the stages. What is a structural racialization? Structural racialization is not referred to an individual racism. Let's put that clearly. It's referred to a set of practices, cultural norms, and institutional arrangements that are reflective of and help to create and maintain racialized outcomes in society, with racialized outcomes uh, reinforcing group-based advantages and disadvantages. So it's not an act of individuals, it's rather an act of institutions. What is co corporate control for uh, in including this talk? Uh, by that we mean, I just want to set, set up timer for myself. Uh, for that, uh, we mean the control of political and economic systems by corporations in order to influence trade regulation, tax rates, wealth distribution. Just like Said shared with us in the beginning, that's exactly what we mean. Today we see that very few controlling uh, too much. That's not good for the health of the planet, it's not good for health of anybody. So among other measures, and to produce favorable environments for further corporate growth. What is the Farm Bill? The Farm Bill, maybe many Americans might know or might not know, but is a multi-year large bill that establishes and maintains federal support for agricultural production, it seems obvious, but also for nutrition programs, for conservation programs, rural development strategies, and more, including international aid trade as well, and research and development within the academia. Those programs are operated in large part through the US Department of Agriculture. So this is very uh, quick overview of uh, the current farm bill that passed 2014. Uh, the spending uh, over the next 10 years about a trillion dollars to cover those programs. So there are 12 programs within this. It's a lot of hell of money. Uh, uh, but in terms of the structure, the food and agricultural provisions and programs of the Farm Bill are divided into overarching category called titles. I'm here using the word programs. Uh, those titles are not static and can change uh, between farm, uh, farm bills themselves. For example, during uh, reauthorization process in itself, so the 2008 had uh, 15 titles, and the one just passed last year has 12. Uh, in, in terms of the process itself, the Farm Bill comes for renewable roughly every five years in Congress. Congressional re, uh, negotiations on the composition of the bill typically takes between uh, two to three years. So it's a very intensive uh, work for a lot of people. Uh, but the particular people, uh, many interest group and corporations shape the Farm Bill by way of lobbying, they do that during the two years and three years. They doing that through a campaign a donation and other such effort. However, we've been seeing that overall, we looked at since 1933 to 2014 farm bills, and we noticed one thing, that there is unbelievable uh, uh, corporate interest and actors that had the greatest influence in pushing for a specific language and policies that advance their uh, respective interests in the farm bill. So that's one surprise for us. And this is one of the reasons why in our methodology we use these two things we thought is very important. How corporate control and influence that bill, but on the other hand, how the racialized outcome of the farm bill impacted uh, communities of color and low income communities throughout the United States. One of the major program, and many of you probably heard this a lot, is the SNAP, which is the, uh, previously known as the Food Stem. It stands for uh, Supplement and Nutrition Assistance Programs. This uh, program is about 80% of the money of the Farm Bill. Uh, and uh, often, especially during the uh, last election, we heard a lot about uh, how uh, especially right-wing think tank and politicians try to stigmatize the folks who live 
uh, or receive uh, SNAP assistance. But what we don't know, that's almost 50 million Americans use that program. And without that assistance, they will really slip in a, a dire poverty. And it could be even worse than that. Research shows that for children living in poverty, access to SNAP in childhood, for example, leads to a significant reduction in uh, incidence of obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes. And for women in particular, uh, a single women household head, uh, on the other hand, will increase at least their economic uh, self-sufficiency. Even though we criticize in our report that uh, only having the SNAP within the context of the farm bill is not the solution for the, the poverty, and I will come to that and I will say why. But yet we still see the value of supporting that in, in the absence of any anti-poverty programs in the United States. Um, so that's the cost and benefit ultimately, ultimately beg the question of whether the SNAP and the Farm Bill more broadly are the best long-term approach to challenging structural poverty, particularly as it's perpetuated by corporate control itself. Despite the uh, challenges and uh, limitation, however, both SNAP and unemployment insurance have indeed have positive effects on both the uh, uh, gross domestic product, the GDP, and on the job growth as well, but also in the long-term effects on the beneficiaries themselves. So now let me shift gear and talk about it, what we've uh, been looking at, what data, what we found. So when I say uh, racialized outcome that generated the uh, structural racializations in this country, uh, issues like poverty is indeed one of them. But also we find out that also it's gendered. So it's not only just hitting uh, people of color, but also women. Low-income folks, people of color, but particularly women. So in 2012, the national average for poverty was about 15%. This number are really shocking for a person. I'm from Sudan, by the way. But for a person who thinks that the United States is the most powerful economic place, that is still, uh, when I come to study poverty, I looked overseas all the time. It's a problem over there. I was shocked that this 15% of the population of this country actually live in poverty. Uh, those are about like 46.5 million people, a lot of people. Uh, yet poverty rates are strongly associated with race and ethnicity in this country. The poverty rate was 26% for Native Americans, 27.2 for blacks, 25.6 25 for Latinos, and 11.7 for Asian Americans. On the other hand, for white was about 9.7%. So I don't want to see why people live in poverty, but it begs the question whether this is structure racialized. So it's not about intention, but it's about institutions. On the other hand also, all of the family groups uh, living in poverty was the highest among them, the one headed by single women. In 2012, 30.9% of all female headed families, about 4.8 million uh, families, were in poverty, compared to 6.3 of all married couple families. It's about 3.7 million families. Finally, among children under age of 18, 21.8% or about roughly 16 million children live in poverty in 2012. So stratification of the labor market itself reflects an undergrid such trend with communities of color frequently overrepresented in very lowest paying jobs. For example, in 2012, 26% of blacks and 26 of the Latinos were employed in the service a notorious uh, low paying industry known in the United States, while only 17% of whites and 18% of Asian American were employed in such uh, industry. This is another way you could conceptualize and think about uh, the level of food insecurity in this country because it's again associated with the same manner that we've been looking at poverty, such uh, since food is uh, part of uh, the GDP, if you will, of families. 
to spend on food. And the average, if you uh, run a calculation, it could be about 14.9% all over the United States. So uh, now let's look at this level of inse uh, uh, food insecurity in the United States. But before I do that, I just would like to read for you the World Health Organization uh, when they define food security. Food security as having consistent access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. That's it. But for us, we think at the heart of it, it actually is a matter of income and poverty. So there is plenty of food in the United States, but some of us cannot access it. Not us in the room, but us in the United States. With that in mind, all programs uh, that aim to remedy food insecurity, most uh, notably the Farm Bill SNAP, uh, hold potential not only as a key nutritional system programs, but are also part of the anti poverty programs and safety net to support historically marginalized communities in the United States, including low income communities and communities of color. This is especially the case was we seen during uh, economic hardship. But here again, uh, we talk about food insecurity in terms of how it's racialized and how it's gendered. It's, it's, uh, it's very shocking, uh, the level of uh, percentage of people who live uh, as food insecure. In 2013, 14% or about 17.5 million of household, <coughs> excuse me, those roughly about 50 million people uh, were food insecure at, last, uh, at least sometimes during the year, with 5.6% of the household experiencing very low food security. Uh, as with poverty, food insecurity is strongly associated again with race and ethnicity, and you can just look at the numbers. I have to move quickly. This is another uh, forces that we see in within uh, the corporate control and influence in our food system. Uh, so this is a second force for us. It's not only control, but also exacerbated food security is the corporate control in the food system. Corporate power has long played a role in the institutions, uh, processes, practices, and infrastructure that make up uh, all, almost all of the U.S. food system, how, how food is produced, uh, how food is processed, distributed, and consumed. So despite the fact that 95.3% of U.S. farms are a small and mid-sized family-owned operations, the remaining 4.7% of U.S. farm, which include large-scale family-owned and non-family-owned operation, accounted for almost 50% of the total value of production. I checked the number 100 times, because I couldn't believe it. Uh, as of 2007, four corporations own 85 percent of the soybean processing industry, 82 percent of the beef packing industry, 63 percent of the pork packing industry, and manufacture about uh, half of the milk we have. While five corporations control 53 percent of the grocery retail, more than uh, uh, what I have here on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide. And globally, believe it or not, only about 500 companies control 70% of the food choices. Among them, the Big Ten, that they generate every year $450 billion. Those include companies you might know of, associated with British food, Coca-Cola, Danone, General Mills, Kellogg, Mars, Mendeleev International, Nestle, Pepsi Cola, and uh, Unilever. Furthermore, 12 companies and I will talk about this later on, uh, also now accounted for about almost 53% of the ethanol production and, and, and the production capacity, and they own 38% of all ethanol production plant. So even if when we think about alternative gap creation, we have to think of the role of corporate in controlling that sector. But within those corporations, I also we looked at the idea of how it's racialized, how it's gender. And you can see for yourself, is really staggering. 
So as of 2012, for example, the large majority of corporate directors of Fortune 500 companies were white men They're at, at average of 74.4%, and alibi substantially lower white women at 13.3%, although white men and women make up 72.4% of the U.S. population. And despite making up 12.6% of the U.S. population, only 3% of the corporate directors were Latinos. Within that, 2.4 are men and 0.7 are women. Finally, despite making 13.6% of the U.S. population, only 6.8% of, of the corporate directors were black. 5.3% of them are men, 1.5% are black women. So it's very staggering. But it gets even worse. Uh, I'm sorry to, to be the bearer of the bad news. Uh, but here again, uh, we looked at the, I don't know if you can see it clearly, uh, we looked at the farm, uh, farmland in the United States and its value also. We noticed very similar. We didn't have data about gender, but we are very sure it's extremely racialized. As of 1999, all private U.S. agricultural land, white people accounted for 96% of the honor. That's about 3.2 uh, million people. And also they accounted for 97% of all of agricultural value. It's about $1.16 trillion. And 98% of the acres of that land. On the other hand, blacks, Native American, Asian Americans, and Latinos and Latinas together accounted for only 4%. Of the honor, there are about 146,000 people, 146, seven or three people. Three percent of all of agricultural value that way they have about 44 billion dollars, and 2.8 percent of the acres is about 25 million acres of agricultural land. I'm making a case here. It's obvious, right? So I have to give all this data in order to say what I wanted to say. But not only that, also in, 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 a, in a venue like this, thinking about uh, how we can take care of the planet and people and to be prosperous, the environment is really playing a key role in the food system. Uh, we know that conventional agriculture, production practices, are, which are encouraged by major food and agricultural policy, including in particular, and believe it or not, the U.S. Farm Bill, are a major contributor to global climate change. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the agricultural sector is the largest contributor to global anthropogenic non-CO2 green gas emissions, accounting for 56% of the emission in 2005. So having food is not an easy thing. In 2013, the EBA reported that the green, greenhouse gas emission from, from uh, uh, agriculture accounted for about 9% of the total U.S. Green, greenhouse gas emission, an increase of about 17% in 1990. So industrial or conventional agricultural practice in particular characterized by the use of many things we know of, such as high yield in plant, animal variety, large scale monocrops, and it goes on and on. It's also a high level of uh, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. And the list is going on and on. All of them together have really large impact on our climate. Furthermore, these practices are themselves made possible through the corresponding use of fossil fuel to power the production of agrochemicals, agromachinery, and uh, increased level of irrigations. In the backdrop of increasing competition for biofuels, uh, as a noble thing people might think about it, production, large tracts of agricultural land now uh, have been used for biomass production instead of food. As a result, we have seen increased food prices and price fertility for many crops that hurt both side of the equation. The small farmer get hurt when we have experience uh, shifting in prices, but also consumer at the other hand. So, in, uh, for example, 
between 20% and 40% of the global food prices increase in 20, 2008 were caused by biofuel expansion. Several studies projected that by 2017, biofuel production could really increase prices for many of the world's stable food. This is, it seems like overwhelming problems, but we think that there is really solutions. So, but we need to think. So in our thinking, we have two ways we think about that. Short-term and long-term strategies. One to do policy mm -hmm. intervention, as the political reality uh, allow us to do, and others, maybe we have to create a different reality. <coughs> so I'm not gonna go to my list. <laughs> Believe me, it's long. But all what you see in, your, in the screen is a noble and important things to do, but it's not enough. So in terms of uh, agricultural production policies, we need to pressure and support the following. Restore the minimum price of crops, reduce high food prices by eliminate biofuel crops payments. All this within the farm bill, by the way. So that's my 20 minutes right there. Um, so I have another 10, great, I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so we, we need to increase the Department of Labor funding to enforce protection for migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. We need to improve access to financing for land and water for new farmers, especially young farmers, low-income farmers, and farmers of color. In terms of the farmers' outreach and assistance, we need to improve outreach and assistance to farmers of color, continue and expand uh, cash advance uh, for environmental quality incentive programs. Uh, I know you don't maybe know the context of, of what I'm just saying. It sounds like uh, this is kind of a strange, but all this is program supported by the Farm Bill. That's $956 billion. So, but it's done in a way that it's not doing this. It's doing something else. So we need to take it back to make it do what it needs to be doing. In terms of research and development for best practices in agriculture, we believe that we need to redirect federal research agenda to support public interest initiative and not corporations. Increase funding for renewable energy research and not biofuel productions or projects. In terms of public assistance programs like the SNAP and other nutrition programs, we need to monitor and reduce corporate influence and gain from SNAPs because they make a hell of money out of it. Uh, in terms of long-term strategy, Sorry for my ugly drawing, but uh, uh, we believe that you cannot have all these demands unless you have a very powerful social movement that is united, that is, like Said in the beginning, that the people at the top or the people in the middle, they work as a buffer zone. So if we don't have the power to mobilize the people in the middle, we really we cannot see change. So. When I say United, why, why we choose food? I'm not an agriculturalist, by the way. But I found that in food system and food movement, you could really generate a great positive social change. Because it could unite all these groups, all of them together and more. You can get all ecological defense folks, racial justice people. You have to think about immigration and refugees. You have to think anti-militarism. You have to think about communities of faith. You have to think about gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender. You have to think about what we do to our nature, how we build communities, how we abolish the prison system, how we think about economic justice, how we give indigenous people their sovereignty back, how we can support our sister, the feminist and gender justice. So in order to do this, we, can, we propose three actions could be taken, or four. One, remove SNAP completely from the farm bill. I know people get mad at me when I say that. They really get mad. Uh, but in order to be beyond the corporate control, we have to do that. But to do that, not just to throw it out and to throw these people under the bus, no. Then we have to redesign SNAP as an anti-poverty program. Not only nutrition, but to say people live in poverty, we need to help them. We have the moral obligation to help them. It's not just we can't give a uh, handout to 47%. No, yes, we do. We do, and we have to do it. Uh, 
And the second thing in terms of the rural development program, we need to strengthen, there is in the farm bill, there is really very successful models. So not all of it is bad. So there is a very successful model in terms of rural development programs. We need to strengthen those and anyone, any other programs look like that. And also we need to create, because that's, it does two things, it create and boost up employment opportunity for communities in rural areas. And, but we need to pressure uh, USDA and Congress and all the lobby around it in Washington DC belt to give, it, to give those programs more central role in uplift farmers and the communities in which they live and work. Finally, to do all this, we really need to bring cooperation into their alignments. We are not anti corporations but we see that there is intrusion of corporate in the public space. They have to go back and do what they do and what they've been designed to do. So through legal means or political means, we need to put back cooperation in their square. We don't say don't work or don't do and don't produce, no. You have a specific things to do, just do them and stay out of the way of politics, out of the way of uh, uh, essential program uh, like anti-poverty programs. So finally I will say this, we believe that structural change requires powerful and united food movement. In order to make demands, and we also believe that such movement have, have to have to be a diverse and, for, and, and to be for racial equity, because a just and democratic food system is not simply the end goal for such a movement. Rather, it's also a strategic means to challenging the structure that embed the possibility for a just life for all peoples in all domains of life. Only when the tactical agenda that I mentioned earlier, the short-term ones, uh, and work of the broad-based food justice movement uphold a wealth, race, ethnicity, and gender-based moral meta-narrative then can the struggle for low-income communities and communities of color and women face with regard to the food system be connected to the struggle that they face elsewhere, including in labor movement, unemployment, health, housing, the school to prison pipeline, and police violence, among other things. Only then can such a movement truly really strive for a just life that uphold dignity for all peoples, not for the few. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And our third paper, Atas Afsal from University of Missouri, Kansas City, Energy, Economy, and Ecology, Reimagining the Troika. Guys, can you hear me okay? Thank you for your presentation. Um, well, as you know, uh, I have to set up my PowerPoint that I forgot. Okay. Here somewhere. Okay. This one. It's already open. Oh, was it? Sorry. All right. Um, as you know, my name is uh, Akhtar Sabso. I am uh, associated with the Binzager Institute as well as the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is actually my second trip to Denison. I first uh, visited about 15 years ago. You know, I was on the Ohio State team. I went to Ohio State here in Columbus and playing squash. So Denison used to have a really good squash team. I don't know if it's still good or no. Um, so anyways, um, so glad to be back. Okay, so the topic of my uh, presentation is energy, ecology, and economy, um, reimagining the Troika. And I'm just going to talk a um, little bit about these three different ideas and uh, their intersections. Okay, so... Um, I just wanted to bring uh, people up to speed. Um, some people here are very familiar with 
um, what is going on uh, with respect to climate. But some of the recent developments I just wanted to bring to your attention. So uh, as you know that China's President Xi uh, was here recently and among the news it was told that China is developing its own cap and trade system. So they're going to um, cap, hopefully cap the number of emissions and then trade them. They're developing their own system. So one of the things that really caught my eye as I was reading about this in the newspaper uh, was that the motivation behind China developing this cap and trade system was really the danger that these, uh, do you remember, um, Ahmed showed that uh, picture from Beijing. You know, they had to um, show the sunrise and sunset on some big screen. So one of the uh, reasons why they're putting this together is that these dangerous levels of pollution uh, may end up causing some political instability. So that's one of the motivations. I mean, that's the extent or magnitude of pollution in China at the moment. Um, most people here, um, Pope Francis was also in the United States recently. Um, he's come out with this official letter, which is called an encyclical. And in this letter, the Pope is now talking about, you know, caring for the environment. So I just wanted to, everybody who, probably everybody knows that, but some people probably didn't uh, read about that. Okay, and finally, um, I think most importantly is this United Nations Climate Change Conference, uh, which is also known as COP21 or CMP11, that's going to take place in late November and early December in Paris. Um, it's a very important conference because the objective is um, to bring together all these different nations and to have legally binding agreements on climate change. So I thought that was uh, interesting. And I um, just wanted to bring people up to speed. Okay, this is helpful. Okay, so um, 20 years, let's fast forward 20 years. You know, let's look at 2035. So the previous slide was 2015, this is 2035. And none of this, I mean, I'm not making, this is from um, an actual report that was published by one of the leading oil companies. So this is their data. Let's look at what they're saying. So they're saying that global economic output is expected to increase by about 115% in the next 20 years. And a big part of that, about 60%, is going to come from China and India. Uh, carbon dioxide is expected to grow by 25%. Um, there is a scenario, it's called 450 scenario by the International Energy Agency, IEA, which basically seeks to limit the concentration of carbon dioxide to 450 parts per million. Um, even though carbon dioxide is going to grow by 25% as opposed to 115% uh, economic growth, it's still uh, too high. And finally, this really caught my eye and I thought it was interesting. Um, in about 20 years, China and India are going to become net importers of oil. So China is going to be importing about 13 million barrels per day and India is going to be importing about 7 million barrels per day. And just to give you a competitive, US, the US was importing about 12 million, so the US about around 14 million barrels per day right now, around that number. Can I, uh, sir, sure, go ahead. Sorry, you just said this came from an oil company? Which yes. One? Um, I mean, BP, <laughs> that's an oil company. That's why CO2 is not gonna go up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, so they just came out with a, a major report. So this is, this, these, uh, this information is from uh, BP's oil report. Oil report. Okay, so, um, so the point that I was trying to make is that, I mean, consider this, these, these large, this, this massive dependency of China and India on, on oil, and what, is, what does that mean for international geopolitics? I mean, China is already moving closer and closer to Middle Eastern sources of energy. 
by developing this string of different little ports that they call a string of ports. So, I mean, we just need to think about these things as well. Um, okay, so going forward a little bit more, 2050, different uh, impact scenar scenarios. So, um, I mean, the optimistic scenario is that um, somehow we are able to prevent global warming and the total amount of global warming is going to be less than two degrees Celsius. Um, however, according to a report by uh, the United Nations, uh, sorry, the World Bank, the title of which is Turn Down the Heat, um, they're saying that about 1.5 degrees Celsius increase is already locked into the Earth's atmosphere system. So even if everything works according to plan, you're still looking at increasing global warming by two degrees Celsius as of right now. Realistic scenario is we are kind of in that region, two degrees Celsius around 2050. And that is going to um, bring about a number of very interesting scenarios, including <coughs> declining crop yields, changing water resources, moving disease ranges. So. Um, the different um, tropical diseases, um, dengue fever, has anybody ever heard of dengue fever? Happens in Brazil. I'm from Pakistan, and Pakistan has been fighting against dengue fever for years now. So I recently read in the news that there is a massive epidemic in New Delhi of dengue fever. Now, so these disease ranges are changing in the world. Um, there's Middle Eastern uh, respiratory syndrome, the disease range of that would change. Ebola is an epidemic. So, I mean, we're looking at a scenario where some of these disease ranges would get out of control. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to see different impact scenarios. A pessimistic scenario, um, that global warming kind of breaches that two degrees Celsius threshold. So we are in the neighborhood, say we are in the neighborhood of four degrees Celsius. Two authors, Wagner and Weizmann, um, have come out with a new book, um, which was reviewed in the New York Review of Books. And they, they're saying that it seems like if we reach that level, four degrees Celsius, we are going to get into what they are calling the new climate normal. There's a new normal, but then they're calling it the new climate normal. And uh, what does that mean? So what they're saying is that um, you know everybody here is um, familiar with um, tail events. So there is a if so so, so events that in the tails of a of a normal distribution um, are unlikely. You know that the probability is uh, there is a low probability of that. So what they're saying is that if we get into that range, uh, the probability of these tail events, catastrophic tail events is going to rise. And uh, we don't know what that is, that is going to bring about. One of the things that could, however, happen is because of massive climate change, you could have, we could see um, you know, mass displacement of human populations. I mean, if water resources dry up, I mean, there are over a billion people who live in India if something happens to uh, change the rural way of life, if agriculture dries up, I mean, where are those people going to go? So if we think, if we think that if we've seen a lot of migrants, refugees, and those kind of problems, imagine a scenario in which all these people are looking for a place to go. OK, so which? Um, brings me to some of the work uh, that I am uh, doing at UMKC. And I just want to talk about three different strands of literature that try to assess the relationship between economic growth and energy consumption. So the first one is environmental economics. And I'm going to speak a little bit about <coughs> economic history. And then finally, ecological economics. Okay. So in the environmental economics, well, uh, 
some people here know that our average or you know your um, usual neoclassical growth models, economic growth models like Solo, for example, when they talk about output, they don't really incorporate energy into the picture. So you basically have, I mean, that uh, little thing up there, Y equals A times F K and L, that's capital and labor. I mean, there's no energy in the picture. And, and what's the reason why there is no um, energy in the picture? I mean, the reason is that uh, a lot of economists believe that because of constant technological innovation, we are always going to be able to substitute non-renewable resources with capital. So we, we're always going to have, I mean, this is their belief, we're always going to have this ability to be able to substitute non-renewable resources with capital. What that means is, what they're trying to say is, that there, there are no meaningful, there is no meaningful physical limit and that our, uh, to our capacity to keep growing forever. This is, this is the interpretation. And uh, so capital and energy are considered substitutes in environmental economics because there is this great belief in constant technological innovation. It's also sometimes referred to as technological optimism, being too, much, too, being too optimistic about technology. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just going to skip that because I just... Uh, spoke about that right now. Okay, so uh, one of the leading um, ideas within environmental economics is this idea called environmental Kuznets curve. Um, and um, so um, I'm just going to show you a picture. So this is what the um, environmental Kuznets curve kind of looks like. So the idea is that, so there is um, per capita income on the horizontal axis and um, environmental deter deterioration on the vertical axis. So the idea is that as countries start becoming richer or you know, making more income, initially there is degradation in terms of the environment. There is more pollution. And then there comes a point, some kind of turning point, where things start to get better. So, so, so the idea is, what, 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 what they're trying to say is that there is a there is a potential decoupling going on that can happen between uh, energy consumption and environmental pollution. And I'm just explaining here that um, it's the relationship, the environmental Kuznets curve is the relationship between p pollution intensity and um, GDP. So this is one of the main ideas um, within environmental economics. Okay, so, so one of the ideas in uh, environmental economics is that uh, somehow there can be a decoupling between um, GDP, GDP can keep growing, however, our energy use will start decreasing. And we'll be able to do that because uh, we have this ability to have constant technological innovation because we can substitute between capital and energy. But, you know, uh, if you look at economic history, um, there are people who have been talking about it. Um, that idea has been challenged that somehow we can keep growing without using, you know, energy. So, for example, uh, research from Wrigley, I mean, he compares there's um, Britain and the Netherlands. Uh, before, before I get there, let me explain that in economic history, the Industrial Revolution is taken as a proxy for economic growth. So Industrial Revolution, maybe 1750 onwards, roughly, roughly, or maybe before that. Uh, so some of these people are arguing that um, have shown that despite similar institutions, you know, the uh, Dutch economic, the 
economic growth in the Netherlands came up against an energy resource constraint. Britain, which had its own domestic coal mines, was able to keep growing, um, and thus it was not able to come up against an energy constraint. So, so this is an idea which is um, um, which directly opposes the main finding of the environmental economics in the sense that these guys are arguing that there is no substitution between energy and capital. So it's not possible to keep growing um, forever. And then I, I have some more evidence here. Uh, for example, um, work by Howard 1994 shows uh, that as the price of wood started increasing in Europe, uh, Britain was able to um, grow, keep growing economically compared to the rest of the countries like the Netherlands and Belgium. Okay, so finally, ecological economics. Um, again, uh, they take issue with the idea of substitution between capital and energy. And, um, you know, ecological economists argue uh, that there are, in fact, limits to nature. You cannot keep growing forever. But remember, the first one was environmental economics. They believe there are no limits to nature. There's substitution between capital and energy. This is ecological economics. These guys believe that there are, there are limits to nature. We cannot keep growing forever. And the reason is, that you cannot really substitute between capital and energy. And, and they, take, they take issue with the idea of, you know, this, this technology optimism that somehow we will always possess this ability to keep growing forever, keep innovating uh, technologically and thus keep growing forever. I mean, one of the ideas that I came across was interesting. Um, it says that Technological innovation actually leads to um, more, not less use of energy. That's an interesting idea. So, so the mechanism that is uh, played out is, you know, so you get a new technology, say, you know, a new way of, um, I don't know, um, making uh, solar energy or whatever, oil. Um, these new ways of making uh, a fuel, the argument goes, decreases the price. And this decrease in price leads to more usage of that quantity. And this idea is also known as Jevons paradox. Um, OK, so just some um, background information. Uh, this, in, within the ecological economics, their theory of energy is based on the second law of thermodynamics. So they argue um, that no production process, no matter how efficient that production process is, can recover all the energy it uses up. So there's a lower limit, meaning, uh, you know, uh, all production processes are going to use up a certain amount of high-grade energy. And use high-grade energy to turn that into low-grade energy, meaning that the total amount of disorder or entropy in the system will keep increasing. Some ecological economists have, make the case, have made the case that the rising standards of living, so, so, so what this means is that no matter how efficient our production processes, we are still going to be using or wasting uh, some amount of energy. So, if we keep making more and more and more stuff, say, especially in the developed world, this means that we are going to keep using more and more and more energy. OK, so finally, um, there, are, um, there is also a um, strand which is known as energy um, GDP. I I'm calling it energy GDP nexus. I mean, these are just uh, using econometrics to test causation uh, between economic growth and energy consumption. I mean, a lot of people here, um, 
So, so, so what I'm trying to say is, what these guys are trying to test is, does economic growth cause energy consumption, or does energy consumption drive economic growth? And a lot of people think that the relationship is clear cut. But when it comes to this strand of literature, you'd be surprised, there is no consensus. I mean, I have looked at studies for India, for example. I mean, uh, a study uh, says that it's economic growth that drives energy consumption. Two years after that, you have a study that says, no, it's energy consumption that drives economic growth. There are some studies which find bi-directional causality. Well, economic growth causes energy consumption, but then energy consumption causes economic growth. So there is confusion. We don't really know what causes which. Um, but there is an interesting point hidden in this strand of literature. So by entertaining the possibility that somehow it is um, economic growth that causes energy consumption, we are also entertaining the possibility that somehow if we can find an alternate way of growing economically, you know, so economic growth is causing energy consumption, we don't really need that energy consumption for economic growth, so we can actually move towards a renewables-based energy regime. We, cannot, we, we don't have to keep relying on a fossil fuel-based energy regime. So, so there is the possibility that economic growth can actually um, go on without energy consumption. Okay, I'm just going to skip the last point. Um, and, I, and I just talked about uh, not having any um, consensus in the field. And I just want to note that given the laws of thermodynamics, the you know, stuff that I, talk about, I talked about, that ecological economists believe that no matter um, which production process we are using and how efficient that production process might be, it's, it, it is always going to use um, waste some amount of energy. It seems a little surprising that, um, uh, that, that somehow we can end up with a decoupling between energy consumption and economic growth. Oh, <coughs> finally, um, this may be interesting for some people here. Um, so this is a, a relationship that I'm uh, looking at in my research. You know, how fossil fuels or energy import leads to monetary policy stagnation, um, especially in non-oil importing emerging economies. So this is the, the, the mechanism that I am looking at. Um, so I'm talking about policy implications of continued reliance on a high um, energy import bill. So what I'm, what I'm looking at right now is that higher energy import bills, you know, once an emerging economy has to import energy in the shape of oil or natural gas or what have you, causes capital outflows. So normally, it would be possible for the exchange rate to, I mean, Normally, there would be a way to correct that balance of payments by having, um, this is my second last slide, so I'm almost done, by, by through a correction in exchange rate. However, uh, in order to maintain a stable exchange rate, and as um, certain economists have pointed out, um, Jan Prager, for example, in uh, some papers, Countries need to uh, keep a stable exchange rate because the stable exchange rate serves as an anchor to inflation expectations. And most of the um, investors outside of that country require a stable exchange rate in order to um, um, you know, invest in a particular emerging economy. So you have a stable exchange rate and at the same time, you have to maintain a tight monetary policy because you want to offer that high interest rate differential to investors outside. So your monetary policy basically becomes a prisoner to uh, all these capital flows 
inflows that you have to attract from the outside. So Keynes um, pointed this out uh, in his um, treatise on money, chapter 36, that, um, and, and certain um, other economists have uh, developed on this idea that international financial liberalization, meaning free outflow and inflow of capital, um, especially since the collapse of Bretton Woods, has led to certain, uh, to developing nations taking on a Ponzi profile. And I'm kind of in the process of uh, building this idea uh, as we speak. So that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Simon, you were quoting up there, if that's Julian Simon, the ultimate resource, you know, the thing, I mean, you were emphasizing, I guess, constant technological innovation, but it really, the, the argument would require, you know, more than that, because it's not just that eventually, I mean, this school argues that economic growth uh, always provides the answer to any problem economic growth creates. That's that's what they believe in. Uh, his book was called um, "Knowledge: The Ultimate Resource," or you know, which who's going to you know take the position against <laughs> that, right? So, but are those innovations always uh, emerging in? a timely manner relative to the problem that maybe eventually we'll, you know, discover answers, but it, the, the, the real technological optimism requires that the, and of course, if you push this, then they go back to the magic of the price mechanism, and some of you may recall there was a famous bet between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich, the biologist, uh, in, around 1970 about what would happen uh, to a variety of uh, resource prices over the next 10 years. And famously, um, uh, Simon won the bet and Ehrlich lost the bet. The, the mistake that both made was betting 
on what was going to happen to prices because they both are assuming that prices actually reflect resource scarcity. Even in orthodox economics, that only is true under the most severe conditions, I mean, in terms of the assumptions that you have to make for prices to actually reflect resource scarcity. So uh, even Frank Hahn, one of the developers of uh, neoclassical theory, said that, you know, whenever someone says that all that we have to wait for is prices to rise if a resource gets scarce or whatever, then you should explain to them that uh, that uh, assumes, you know, perfect knowledge on the part of all participants, perfect knowledge of the future, uh, perfect futures markets, uh, complete, you know, markets and uh, no money in the economy and on and on and on with the, you know, the assumptions that would be required for that actually to, hold, I just thought I would mention that. Um, mm -hmm. And Elsa D is going to bother me if I don't, uh, if I don't remember, uh, but, you know, if nobody has anything to say, I'm very disappointed, <laughs> I'm very disappointed uh, if nobody has anything to say, but, um, okay. Um, oh, hold on. There's a question for me. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, I was, um, okay, so the one curve where the um, human development index, and you said like 50 uh, energy servants, it levels off, and then you're talking, you're talking about, um, can you have growth without, um, now you'll have, uh, so with efficiency, I mean, one of the things that's, we're like the Western, we're so inefficient that if we focus a lot on inefficiency, like California has had, you know, they had a lot of growth and really not much energy change. But I, I presumably at some point then you'd get where if you really were efficient, then things would change. I mean, then, then you'd have to have. But we, right now, we're so inefficient that, what do you think? The very first thing that I always say is actually look at the inefficiencies first and then think about uh, the renewable energy systems. Otherwise, you can be throwing your money in the air, right? Right. So um, uh, definitely, these two have to be coupled together. We cannot really work with. Make sure your mic's on. Should I stop repeating this again? Or yeah. All right. So basically, these two have to be coupled. You cannot really talk about renewable energy systems without talking about uh, conserving energy in the first place. Um, as for the question that Matt was asking uh, about uh, biomass uh, and the use of biomass and uh, how, how, uh, how would that affect agriculture, for example, actually, um, if you notice that I was not, even though I used the term biomass, but I was actually referring to always to bio waste. And the reason for that is because there's always the debate uh, or the issue of uh, fuel versus food issue, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm more, of favor, uh, more in favor of uh, bio-waste. Whatever you're going to be throwing away anyway, whatever is left over, let's make right. use of it, sure. right? Now, in terms of uh, fertilization, uh, of course, using animal dung is always has been a, a, the traditional way of, of fertilizing things. Um, in the case of biomass and bio-waste energy, uh, some people call it as, uh, or consider it as uh, carbon neutral, meaning whatever gets emitted in the atmosphere in terms of carbon can get reabsorbed again by the plant and then we start using it again. However, uh, some people consider gasification, the gasification process as, as carbon negative. And the reason for that is the list, uh, leftover char can actually be used as a fertilizer. And um, I'm not sure if the word carbon negative is actually good but, uh, or uh, represents accurately what's going on, but it's actually, it's, uh, in terms of the process itself, it's good. So you're producing energy from waste, that's number one. Number two, you're actually using whatever's left over to fertilize the land and produce better biomass. Thank you. Uh, so, oh, please go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. El-Sheikh. Uh, I was very interested in your comments about the corporation, corporate control and corporate impact on the agriculture. Uh, and you mentioned specifically we need to bring corporations into alignment 
I, I'm wondering if you're familiar with the concept here in the United States that corporations are considered persons with constitutional rights. Is that uh, something that you have uh, considered in, in working towards alignment? And I say that because that's what I'm involved with. Is that something that is meaningful to you? And so, the that I work with, I have to Okay. So, so, what we've seen in the last over 100 years, that a cooperation, even the founding father of this nation, thought about cooperation have a very specific role to play in American society. Uh, today, we all, we cannot ignore that the role in which that cooperation actually they undermine not only equality, but they undermine even the democratic system of the United States. Uh, and, and, and that's need no evidence. But one of the things that I think uh, the activist uh, uh, justice in the Supreme Court, in the right, not the one in the left, uh, uh, especially uh, during the Citizen United they really turn over a long-standing tradition in American politics for 100 years that considered cooperation as a person. That was, in my opinion, my humble opinion, and the institute I work for is extreme uh, uh, deviation from having a democratic society that individuals who live in the society have say, actually, in their design of their cultural, social, political institutions. Uh, so, if we don't have any say to say in our institutions, I'm not sure if that's, uh, this type of democracy is any, have any useful for us. So, what we're suggesting are uh, the following. We file a lot of amica briefs in the, in the Supreme Court to actually turn down Citizen United. We've been unsuccessful, but we will continue to do so. Uh, we think that cooperation has a role in society, whether that's a public uh, cooperation or private cooperation. We have fantastic public uh, uh, cooperation. One of them is the BBS, right? One of them, it could be uh, 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 here, in, here in Ohio, could be EBA, uh, no, the American Electric Power, right? So always, cooperation is not a bad thing, but how you design them and their role, and to control their role, like just you control citizens, is very important. Uh, you cannot let them not only design politics, but actually driving politics in the United States. So what we see now, uh, most of our uh, uh, public officials, they cannot go against cooperation. The reason is simple. And maybe Rohan, maybe tomorrow will, they will talk about it, the modern uh, money network. If we don't get money out of politics, we don't. But it's not just money. That's the point I want to make. You mentioned no, Citizens uh, United. Citizens United is all about money. Corporate personhood is the courts and the right of a corporation to get what it wants by taking a case to court and winning because they have the money to support their case. No, That's I, a completely I, different thing from Citizens United. I'm, I'm not quite sure if I think that uh, consider corporate as a personhood, uh, first of all, is the right thing to do in a mature democracy. No, but it is. It is a fact. Please, uh, could you just, you know, uh, change your seat again and okay. we'll continue with the, you know, we're only going to go into a back and forth so much on a tangential topic or whatever, especially if you represent that uh, Can I just uh, close my Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we could have a different uh, legal argument about that. But what I'm trying to say throughout history, in particular in the United States, that cooperation always had a very specific role to play. Cooperation are not person. Cooperation cannot be considered a person. That's a twist of the American Constitution uh, since we have Citizen United. Cooperation cannot think. Cooperation doesn't have a religious. The cooperation doesn't have. So, so if we agree on all this, uh, the current reality, the current political reality in the United States tell us otherwise. So we need to turn that around. Cooperation could play an effective, good role. But one of the power of cooperation also, besides the legal means, is money. And that's when they've been able to co-opt the system and to create uh, a foot soldier within our Congress, actually to lobby for them rather than the other way around. <laughs> so I will stop here. Yes, go ahead, Paul. Sure. Hi, Paul Herman, HIP investor. I'm speaking tomorrow. So if I ask a tough question, please bring one tomorrow. <laughs> um, 
Uh, my, que my question really focuses on, uh, thanks for your presentations, which are all um, fascinating. My question really focuses about this energy and GDP. So obviously the, the X factor is what is the innovation and what are the limits? So California has been able to grow GDP while uh, not growing emissions as fast, so that's great. Um, but these world outlooks, especially like BP's, uh, finally, we got the Exxon report uh, from the 1970s that said there's this big upswing in emissions that's coming that you know got repressed, but finally open sourced recently. Um, so my question is really around what are the structures that you think will work? Uh, carbon tax, cap and trade, some other type of um, you know what mix of policy, uh, capitalism, and other structures can come together whether they be transparency, like the SEC can mandate but hasn't yet, the you know, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board to, and Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, combined with uh, whatever tax policy or incentive structure uh, to get that um, GDP to emissions to go um, in, the, in an innovative way. Thanks. Thank you for your question. I think that's a, a brilliant uh, question because uh, you were, have just cut to the chase and asked me, you know, what needs to be done. Um, well, I am um, looking at some interesting literature, which is uh, known as the energy regime literature, and that talks about how the world went from having coal as the dominant fossil fuel to having um, petroleum or oil, shall we say, you know, petrol, petroleum and diesel as the dominant fuel. And um, it's a world systems approach or the long wave approach um, uh, in the literature. And they, and they really link it to uh, first the domination of the British Empire and the, and the fuel for the British Empire was really coal. And as the British Empire started declining, uh, you know, you, you see this ascent of oil as the dominant fuel. So the story being painted is that um, a fuel is not used for, a, for energy generation just because it has certain properties. It is, it is also used because there are certain types of institutional frameworks that enable the greater usage of that fuel. So uh, there is this approach in the literature, which is known as the energy systems approach. I think you mentioned energy systems, but I don't know if you were referring to it in the way that I'm about to refer to it right now. OK. Um, so this, this, this energy systems approach, which, which says that uh, the, um, the usage of energy in any system cannot be dissociated from the institutional or the political framework. So, in the final analysis, obviously, we are going to have to move towards an entire um, new institutional framework or a new energy regime, if you will, in which you would have the um, requisite policies, incentives, and institutions to move modern production processes from uh, being reliant on fossil fuels today to being reliant on renewable fuels in the future. So what we really require is a sea change in a number of different things, uh, not only incentives, but institutional framework as well. Thank you. Yes? Can I add one thing? Oh, oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, I think this is really very uh, difficult, difficult question. Uh, in, in my uh, opinion, I don't think that carbon tax, carbon credit, all the above are going to work. Because it's still, uh, I come from a background of a structural arrangement of anything you do, anything you design. So structurally will harm all the poor and the marginalized, whether that in global context or within the global north itself. So if you can imagine since 1960, I wasn't born yet, but uh, we consume almost 40% of the ecosystem of the earth. 
So there is no way we can go this way, no matter what we do. So I think there is a profound problem in the political economic system we have today, which is, is a neoliberalism that extremely privatizes every aspect of our life. So we need, as a people of this planet, that we care about planet, nature, and, and the, the smaller human species, we need to figure out a system that is more uh, fair and equitable, and we can share it for good. So the idea that I can go and because I have the ability to dump my carbon toxic in other nations because I can pay money, that's really one of the most criminal acts I could think of uh, if anyone come from out of the environment telling me that. But what I think like country like, for example, Norway, using their sovereign wealth and completely de-invest from uh, fossil fuel, even though their economy is fossil fuel economy, that's for me a hopeful way. So we can think more innovative how we can use our money, even our sovereign wealth as country. Uh, Qatar, for example, have the same amount of money and the same innovative idea of Norway, but they didn't use their money to create, uh, to die invest from fossil fuel. We need to push those in the larger scale of things, the larger scheme of things, a structural way that we all, we can inhabit this climate. I work within climate refugees. So what uh, Agdos proposed, it's, it's not a gloom scenario, it's happening, but the scale of it is small. We are not noticing. Over time, it's going to happen unless we intervene today, not tomorrow, right now. Yes, sir. My question uh, frames it around the global economy versus localizing the economy. Uh, what Ahmed uh, proposed in terms of the simplicity uh, approach to uh, uh, easiest, simplest solution would be consistent with a localized solution. Uh, El Sadiq's comments about the, uh, the food system, localization of the food system would be seemingly an antidote to what a, the commodity, larger global food system that we have. I'm not so sure about uh, the other presentation. It's, it certainly relates to whether the energy, knowledge issues, if you look at it in terms of the global economy, that's one way to look at it. But people like David Corton, uh, Michael Schumann, Stacy Mitchell, people looking at it from the point of view of the localization as an antidote. Uh, there's a film produced by the International Society for an Ecological Culture out of Berkeley that, uh, called Economics of Happiness, which would argue that localization is really the antidote to the excesses of the global economy, which are creating the global warming climate change issues. I did remember my uh, point, I mean my question about LCD's paper, uh, and that was on those poverty numbers, uh, was that as defined by the official U.S. poverty line? Because as you know, as we all know, I mean, yes. that is, you know, I always tell well, the kids, Anybody who sets that has, should have to live on it for a year, <laughs> live on whatever the line is. Um, so that, if you use maybe you know an alternative measure, that we, the, the numbers would be. You, know, oh, you are absolutely worse. right. I, uh, one of the challenges when you work with data is you have to rely on some oh. centralized data, right? Yeah, so we know that the, the whole unemployment rate <laughs> and poverty rate, oh. are all is bogus numbers in the United States, right. and the number and reality is really higher, higher than that. But even giving those the lower ones, right. it's really shocking uh, details. Uh, but if I may yes. just go back to this uh, idea of uh, localize, uh, globalize. I think the solution has to come from both. So I'm a big uh, proponent of uh, a huge movement in the global south called food sovereignty. This going beyond just localize it. Yes, local food system is extremely important because we could take some actors out of this equation. One of them is the fossil fuel com consumptions. We know today that if we just check the, the food we ate today, it will most likely come from far away. And, and this idea of making those items so cheap and available to us is, is really not harming all the people who are harvesting them or working or breaking their back, but actually harming our environment, right? So that's everyday struggle we, we have to uh, uh, grapple with. 
So the food sovereignty movement emerged and led by the largest social movement of peasant farmers in the world, La Via Campesina, the bass of the peasant. Uh, emerged from Latin America, but today it existed everywhere, including North America. It consists of uh, six principles, basic, that food is not for trade, period. Food is for people. People have the right to design their own food system, how their agricultural design, who consume them, how they do that, and their food has to be culturally appropriate to them. So we don't feed the people who don't like rice, rice, because that's what is available. Uh, the second thing that food uh, and the producer of food has to be respected, in particular women, because today we know that 70% of our food in the global south comes from women. 70% of our food. And we have no whatsoever economic respect for them. And actually we have physical violence against them. So that needs to be changed. And that, that's led by a global system, not by a local system. That's not a corrupt politician somewhere in this place or that place, but this is a centralized theme of neoliberalization of every aspect of our human life. So we need to think of this. If we think about food sovereignty, we could think about those intersection of, of local and global, because local is global and global is local. I agree with you completely. Thank you very much, and I, I just want to uh, ask if you want the other uh, two want a final word, or you? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Last question. Um, okay, I'm Ellen Brown, and I'll be speaking tomorrow. Um, the, this this uh, conference is about sustainable full employment. So in um, the '70s, it was we had stagflation, and it was argued that you couldn't have full employment without driving up prices. And then the response to that that we money reformers always make is yes, you can because. Uh, if you put people to work, they will have more money to spend. It will, they will spend it on goods and services, and p um, the market will respond by producing more goods and services, so goods and services will rise to meet demand. So I always make that argument, and I, there's always one young person, you know, because they worry about these things, that will say, yes, but if you increase supply, then uh, you will use up the, resource, the natural resources. So I just wondered how you all were, would respond to that. I mean, I, I have a response that I do, but since you're kind of experts in that field, maybe you've got some. Well, I, I will just that. say that the entire rest of the conference, I think. <laughs> we'll answer that. <laughs> well, not we'll answer, I don't want to say that, but addresses. Right. That's it. So that's what it's all about. Yeah. We have to produce enough to live without destroying the earth and ourselves, yeah. right? I mean, our economic requirements, set certain kinds of minimal requirements, right, in terms of we have to have enough food for everybody who's alive, and the, right, and then, you know, not destroying the earth and ourselves kind of sets a maximum. I mean, there's qualitative, for sure, aspects as well, but either problem alone would be challenging enough, but both at once is it is, I think it is the challenge of our time. Of course, of course, all of these other issues, you know, that people are raising are also part of the big picture, but of course, if the panel would like their, uh, you know, want to address the, answer the question, it's a very hard question to answer in a short period of time, but yeah, I mean, we will all be discussing this for the next, you know. One thing you can do is, 30 yeah. hours. Pardon? Make planned obsolescence illegal. <laughs> Make it absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's thank our presenters. <laughs> and please uh, join us for a uh, reception, coffee, tea. Dinner upstairs. Uh, and dinner upstairs. Yeah.